should be having Ricky Steamboat here at some point. And we also have Brian Alvarez here. And uh, we're going through a bunch of uh, emails here. Let me see what – there's actually a couple of questions here I wanted to get to. Uh, we also got some phone calls that we're going to get to in just a second. Um, this is from Muhammad who says, uh, for how long do you think the Bret Hart-Kevin Nash partnership will last? I thought they hated each other because of Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart. Um, they don't hate each other. Um, Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart actually do hate each other, but it's business. And uh, if they wanted Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart to be a tag team, possible. Uh, let's see. This is... Uh, recently, another online wrestling show, WCW Live, has been making various oh, various excuses for the WWF and WCW ratings. Everyone in the show has agreed ratings are not accurate. That explains why the WF ratings have not shot through the roof during their unopposed hour and why WCW's ratings have not been up more. How accurate are the ratings, or are these guys just making excuses? There's some truth to it. I do not want to criticize them unless I hear the tape of exactly what they said. But the ratings, there's no such thing as 100% accurate or anything like that, but they're as close to accurate as we've got. And if they are, um, they are as accurate this week as they were six weeks ago, 10 weeks ago, 20 weeks ago, and 100 weeks ago. So for comparison purposes, they are accurate. Actually, hasn't it been that every time a company has low ratings, they say that they're screwed up? Uh, yes, I remember when the WWF was losing in the ratings, I used to hear that all the time about how ratings ratings are not accurate, and in fact, the only accurate measure is how many tickets you sell to the matches, because at the time, the WWF was doing pretty well selling some tickets to the matches, and, you know, they were, you know, you remember all those things about how Ted Turner, like, bought the ratings and silly things yeah. like that? Yeah. Well, if they're screwed up now, they've been screwed up since WCW was killing Raw. Yeah, I think that they're... I think that they're not perfect, and I think they're pretty damn accurate. So, anyway. Uh, Alex Melly says, on an MTV special a couple of years back, there was an American wrestler in Japan who claimed to be a shoot fighter or something and was supposed to be really great. What's the deal? Do you remember that, Brian? That was Bart Vale. And, um, oh, we got Ricky Steamboat on the line, so we'll get to him in just a second. But let me uh, quickly answer that question. That was Bart Vale, who, was, uh, who did uh, pro wrestling matches in Japan for... Uh, I know he worked for Fujiwara Gumi. I think he worked for the old UWF. He he actually also did K1 fights and he did he worked for he did extreme fighting. So he did real matches with them as well. You know shoot matches. Um, but he was on claiming to be the world shoot fight champion, um, and which was which was actually a pro wrestling championship that he that he got. He didn't win it in Japan. What happened was um, he was promoting um, f excuse me Fujiwara shows in Miami. And he was promoting himself. Basically, he, he wrestled Fujiwara in Miami and beat Fujiwara in a pro wrestling match and, and for what was called the World Shoot Fight Championship. Um, and that's where that title got started. And um, you know, he made a lot of claims. And unfortunately, when he went into extreme fighting, uh, he fought actually Kazunari Murakami, who's the guy who we just talked about earlier in the show in that match at the Tokyo Dome on the 4th. And um, Kazunari Murakami knocked him out. It was actually a pretty, pretty intense match. And Bart Vale hasn't really been been talked about much in the world of shoot fighting, although um, I actually heard that he did an interview for a book where he said some really he said some really crazy things in the interview, you know, about uh, Ken Shamrock and, uh, you know, claiming that he he did a match, which actually he, he got a lot of fame. There was an article on, on Bart Vale once in Sports Illustrated as well um, where he talked about, um, but, but in, you know, he has always claimed, his big claim to fame as a shoot fighter was, uh, in a match in Miami, he knocked out Ken Shamrock, which was, in fact, in a professional wrestling match. And I think that there were a lot of people who were kind of seething because he kn it was no big deal until Ken Shamrock became a big superstar in UFC, at which point Bart Vale started promoting himself as the guy who knocked out Ken Shamrock. And I remember reading in a Black Belt magazine article, they had, like, the top ten shoot fighters in the world, and they had Bart Vale's name in there. And one of the reasons was, or actually the main reason was, well, of course, he knocked out Ken Shamrock. So anyway, well, the moral of the story is, if you make your own belt, you can be any damn thing you want. I guess I guess so. Let's go. We've been waiting for this one for a long, long time. We've got Ricky Steamboat on the line. Ricky, how are you doing today? Good. Is this Dave? This is Dave. Dave. It's how are long, you? When was the last time you and I talked? I guess at Cincinnati at uh, the Pillman Memorial. Right, at the Brian Pillman Show. How have right. you been? Right. Good, good, good. Uh, been good and busy. Yeah, how's uh, so? So, what are, what have you been up to? Just uh, you running the gym, and what else? I've um, got a health club up here in Cornelius, a little bit north of Charlotte. Been doing that for about four years now. Um, and this past year, getting my son has been uh, getting involved in car racing. 
Yeah, you had mentioned that to me when we when we talked before. How, what, yeah. what, it's like it's like go kart racing or? No, nah, well, uh, not really. Um, I would say it's a, it's a, a level or two above that, and uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of these legend cars that race. Uh, we race the same night as they do. Um, Richie's car, they'll they'll run up to about 80 miles an hour, and you know, and uh, it's a good start for the young kids. And his next level will be legend cars, and then it'll be a full size car because he he really wants to pursue this racing. So he's really into the, the racing thing. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. it's a lot of fun for Dad too. Yeah. I'm, now you. Did you get him involved? Because I, I remember there was – wasn't there a period where you, where you were working on, like, pit crews and things like that? Um, not working on it at a, at a regular basis, but I did do uh, a pit crew, one Charlotte uh, Coca-Cola 600 with uh, Rusty Wallace's team in Charlotte. Uh, I don't think it was about uh, 1990, and that was, uh, that was a race he won, Coca-Cola 600. And uh, – I did do uh, a celebrity late model race on a dirt track, and uh, I won that one. That was that was kind of neat. So uh, I'm an old hot rod nut from the 70s, and when I was in school, I used to do some drag racing at the drag strip. So this thing here with working on Richie's car and him watching him race and and all that kind of stuff is uh, is really neat. I, I enjoy it, and he loves it too. What uh, have you been watching? Uh, do you watch wrestling a lot now, or a little, or um, how, how how close do you keep up with things? Uh, well, I, I probably watch it a total of uh, maybe an hour a month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe an hour a month. Yeah, I, not not a whole lot. Not a whole you're lot. So you're semi caught up with. Uh, I mean, it's it's a totally different world than the world you left uh, five whatever it was four or five years ago. Right. Yeah. 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 What do you think about what do you think about the way everything's changed and and uh, just every just everything that's happened in wrestling, I guess. Well, you know, David, you know, we gotta, you know, things gotta move on and um, new generation, um, uh, new way of of doing things. Um, I understand all of this, although in in some of the ways that they're doing it, I don't don't quite agree with it. Maybe it's because um, I came along from. You know, like the old school or something like that. When the old timers were were breaking myself in, breaking Savage in, breaking Flair in. You know, uh, we were sort of taught from that school. Um, uh, mid '80s, Vince McMahon took wrestling to another level, and um, here we are at the end of this century, and um, I think it's taken to another level. And I, you know, I get a lot of comments from. Fans that used to watch it yesteryear, but uh, you know they kind of liked liked it then. Uh, but then when you talk to the to the new generation of fans that are watching it now, you know they like what they're watching, uh, and of course they don't have any way to compare it because they didn't watch it yesteryear. They didn't watch wrestling in the 70s and 80s and stuff like that. So, you know, I I'm in a position to where I can look back and I can see where wrestling was. I can see where it is today and the way I would call it is that I understand that we have to take it to another level, you know. And uh, although, once again, I don't agree with some of the things they're doing, and it's maybe it's because, uh, you know, I was brought up with a little bit of the old school in me. You know, when Savage and Flair and Hogan, when we when we started coming along in the mid-'80s and WrestleManias and all that kind of stuff, we, we brought wrestling to another level. Um, I, I, and at that time, always keeping in mind, too, you know, a little bit more – closer to the family and the kids could watch it and, and stuff like that but you know you got to understand what the way everything else is going in in, uh, in television I mean you look at soap operas 20 years ago and and, and what they're doing today shoot uh, what they're doing today you couldn't have done uh, 20 years ago and so it, it's just an evolution you know hey come on we got to move on you know okay Are we there? Okay, we had our uh, daily interruption right there, and uh, we're back uh, with Ricky Steamboat and Brian Alvarez. And uh, Rick, uh, with the, the guy we have on the phone is uh, Brian Alvarez. from uh, fig He does Figure Four Weekly, and I just want to introduce you to since he's on the line as well. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Brian. How you doing? Pretty good. Good. I can, I can barely hear you on this end. Okay, Brian, speak up. Um, 
Brian, Brian, uh, how, did you, you, you've seen most of the Steamboat Flare stuff, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we had, I was actually, right before the show started, I got back uh, some of the old issues of the, of the Observer, and, you know, back in 89, and I mean, one of the things that uh, I, you know, just jogged into my memory was, in 1989, uh, Rick Steamboat and Rick Flair had, um, they had a lot of matches all over the country, but three national matches, so to speak, two pay-per-views and one uh, national special, which went 55, 56 minutes. And they finished one, two, and three for match of the year that year, and nobody has ever uh, approached. There's never been a one, two, or anything like that. It was just like when I looked back on it and and looked at the comments that a lot of people were writing, and it was just wow. You know, it was like uh, looking back. It's like there were there were people. I mean, a lot of people in this. We we did a, like a best of the '80s book, yeah. and a lot of people were talking about you know your match in New Orleans, Nashville, Chicago is like the the greatest match that they had ever seen. You know, that's what people were saying. In 89, when you did those matches, it was, um, you know, looking back, and, and even over the last week or two since the decade started, you know, we've had a lot of guests, and we talk about, people have asked about, like, the greatest matches of all time, and those matches invariably come up. Well, even, even like, uh, a lot of matches 10 years ago, when you look back on them now, they don't seem as good as they were then, but those matches, you look back, and they're still awesome. Rick, you there? Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah. listening to you guys. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> you know, I, I get a lot of comments about that too. Whether um, and, and it's, most of the time it's with the the fans that have been following wrestling for the last ten or fifteen years. And um, the question asked to me is that you know, um, who was who was the greatest match? You know, who did I wrestle that had my, that the greatest match? And well, you know, it's. You know, it's almost a flip of a coin because if you you got to look at it in several different ways. You know, a lot of people talk about the the match I had with Savage at uh, WrestleMania three at the Silverdome, okay? And then they then they asked me about the Flair matches uh, that I had the three matches in, in 1989. Well, um, my my answer to that, and, and and in today's world when I'm talking to the wrestling fans, my answer to that is this: Savage is the kind of guy that you know, he likes to make sure that every single move, every single point, every single reason in the match, the storyline, the psychology is is pretty much um, taken apart, uh, dissected. Uh, if it works, we'll keep it, and, and then we're going to use it and thought out, okay, planned out. Um, and then, of course, uh, matches with, with Rick and I, we look at each other in the locker room, and he says, okay, I'll just see you in the ring. You know, so I don't know. When, when I talk to the guys, the boys, and they ask me that question, I say, well, look, um, if you want to look at it from a professional point of view, which is within our, our niche or our circle, I would have to say the matches I had with Flair because we would, we would just go out there and just wing it and um, listen to crowd response and psychology and if something came up in the course of the match and we got a good response from it, you know, with the fans, and then okay, we got a little fork in the road here, and we're going to take a right, and and, and it changes. And uh, but with the, with the savage, you know, with me working with uh, with Randy, it was we're going to do this step one through step 157, and whether we get responses or whether you know um, if it works. We just we just keep right on going through the numbers. So uh, mostly when I talk to the guys and they ask me about that, they, you know, guys that have uh, in the business now but were watching us work then that they weren't in the business. But that's my answer. I said, you know, you got one that's everything's pretty well laid out, and then you got one with just a couple of two old pros in there that just we're just going to go in there and wing it. So really, uh, I think the hardest part is the hardest of the two decisions would be um, to go out there and have a match and just use your instinct and use your ears and, and your psychology and stuff like that that you've learned and, and do a match like that and carry it for 55 or 56 minutes like the one we had in New Orleans. You know? Someone once told me that as far as like the WrestleMania 3 match with Savage, you were talking about like step 1 through 157. Yeah. And I heard that you guys had every single spot numbered and that on the plane, you could sit there and go, Randy, spot 42, and he'd go, arm drag. And you had the entire match worked out and memorized to, to that uh, 
I guess to that is, is that uh, exactly how it occurred, or? Well, you know that's uh, that, that's a pr- pretty close description. Although we wouldn't do it on the plane because we try to kayfabe it, okay? Yeah. So, um, you know, while we're on the road, maybe in the locker room, or, or or he would come to my room, or I would go to his. You know, we would we would have this thing scripted out, and so we would uh, we got to the point to where I would turn page after, in my notebook. I'd turn page after page after page. Finally, um, about the fourth page, I said, "Okay." This is step number 112. I'm going to do this, this, and this. Tell me the rest of the match. And he would go through and tell me the rest of the match. And then he would get his book out, and he would flip through some pages, and he would say, okay, I'm on step number 86, and I'm going to be doing this, this, and this. Tell me the rest of the match. So this is, you know, that's the way it was uh, It was. It was done. We so would how take... long before uh, WrestleMania did you plan the whole thing out? Um, probably... Oh, a good month. Wow. We wow. would take we would take bits and pieces of ideas that we came up with and try it in the house show that we were working that night. Okay? And if we got a pop from it, if we got a response from it, I said, Okay, we're gonna use that in the in the pay per view. Uh, where are we going to put it, you know, we'll decide. But we got a good response from it tonight and we're gonna use it. So we would come up with different ideas and different little scenarios and different High spots and 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 try them, but we never not once would take the match from A to Z, and while we're on the road and test it, we never did that. We I think you know a little bit of pride and ego was we we'll, we've come up with good stuff here, and we're going to put it together, and we're going to just do it on the pay per view, you know. So. Yeah. Uh, what I thought was cool about that was because in the match there was like this one spot where the referee dropped down and. As he was getting down on all fours, his, like, hand hit the mat once, and then he did a two-count, but the crowd popped like they thought it was the pinfall. Right. And you guys knew that it wasn't, and you didn't even you didn't even miss a beat. Right. Well, you know, the ref was in on that. You know, we, you know, so many times, you know, our goal is to, uh, is to paint a picture to where the fans think that they're going to be calling the fall, and then we, we, um, we sucker them. You know, um, so that was a know, and, spot. With t- and with today's workers, I don't know how d- in depth they get into even thinking about little stuff like that. You know, yeah. But it just, um, you know, even people at home, and um, and that's that that was the whole uh, the importance of it was the fact that Randy and I were saying, God, this is going to be at the Silverdome. This is uh, you know pay per view WrestleMania number three. You know, this is. And then when we heard reports that the dome was sold out, you know, there's going to be 90,000 people there. And so, you know, with the interest and everything um, being around Hogan and Andre, and, and deservingly so, being around those two guys, we said, Savage and I were looking at each other, well, let's take advantage of the situation. If the Silver Dome has, has got 90-some thousand, you can just imagine what the buy rate and then the pay-per-view numbers are going to be. I mean, Hogan and Andre, okay, they drew the show and everything else. They drew the house. They drew the pay-per-view. But let's steal that son of a gun. And and we tried our best to do that. And uh, I just want to really quick read this email. It's from uh, Professor Larry DeGarris, who actually wrestles as Professor Larry Briscoe. He's a professor of sports management, assistant professor of sports management at Washington State University, uh, who knew Damian Demento. And he said Damian Demento's real name is Phil Thies. He was trained by Johnny Rods in Brooklyn and worked as Mondo Clean for several years, which we have talked about. He left the WF to have surgery. When he returned, he wanted to do a new gimmick called 3D, a comic book character come to life. Vince was willing to take him back as Damian Demento, but he didn't want to do it. So he did a Bruce Willis movie, Die Hard 2. He still works some Northeast independent shows as one of the bums, a bushwhacker-type version of two homeless guys. And so anyway, that's the story <laughs> on Damien Demento. Somebody had, somebody had, somehow that name came up in the first hour. The, the, the I wonder where they, Briscoe worked. That's around my area. Um, yeah, he's uh, he's a professor at the college, and he's, he still wrestles too. There was a story in the, uh, I think it was in the Seattle paper. I saw a story about uh, about about him, and uh, you know, like this professor with a background as a as a professional wrestler. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, David, uh, I like I like your comment there with uh, Demento. Working like uh, the bushwhackers with the two homeless guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what the guy said. That was quick. That was yeah. 
Go okay, ahead. let's let's we've got Andy in Los Angeles here. Andy, what's happening? Hey, good afternoon, guys. Pleasure to talk to you, Ricky. Um, Dave, just one thing before I, uh, my questions for Ricky. Did you see The Rock on uh, Fox News this weekend? I, I did not. No. He was on with Judith Regan again because she's the publisher of his book, and he was he was really out of character and very very subdued. Um, nothing controversial came of it, but he was he, he appears to be doing all of his media rounds. Uh, as himself rather than as the rock character, which after seeing him on MTV when he hosted it along with Mick, uh, and he was in character where he came off as just an arrogant prick, uh, I was actually kind of glad that he stayed out of character this one time. So that's that. Uh, Ricky, a uh, bunch of questions for you if, if I can get to them all. I heard a rumor that you said you thought you had one good match left in you and you wanted it to be with Flair. Is that true? Uh, yeah, there, there, there could be some truth about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been asked, and, uh, I mean, I've been asked mostly by fans, but not by promoters. Um, What's your doctor said to that? Uh, well, it'd be taking a chance. That's the deal. Mm-hmm. Just taking a chance. And so, the, the question that, that came to me was, uh, who, with, with the number of fans, is who would it be? And, and I, I really had three, Three people that I've enjoyed over the years, uh, uh, Savage, Flair, and then towards the end of my career, in 94, I, I did a lot of work with Austin, So, uh, and I like Steve. Um, so th- those are my three choices of guys. What were your thoughts? You know, you, you uh, helped Austin a lot. I mean, he said yeah. that to many people early right. in his career, doing the tag teams and then later singles matches. Right. Um, what... What what was your like reaction when Austin hit it, like so big in wrestling like last you know two years or so? I was happy. I was happy, and I tell that to everybody, um, even gym members at my club. I said, you know, I I, I wrestled Austin in my um, pretty much on a steady basis with uh, Pillman and him were tag team, and then Austin in single matches pretty much, oh um, you know about the last year of my career with WCW. So. Um, uh, I knew what kind of money he was making. I knew what kind of at that time. You know, I, I don't uh, I don't keep in contact with Steve that much now, or for the last couple of years. But at that time, um, this guy was willing to work. This guy was willing to listen. This guy worked his butt off in the ring. This guy worked when he was hurt. I mean, he had a he had bad knees then. Uh, I know he's got a bad neck now, but at that time he had uh, bad knees then. He's got a bad um, everything. He'd be blowed up as a son of a gun in the ring, but he would not stop. He would not. St- <laughs> he would not stop. When it was time for a comeback, he'd be there for the feed. Um, you know, I, and I grew to like him as much as admire him because he, uh, uh, he was the kind of guy that I would. I was saying, well, he's kind of looking up to me, and he would come to me, and he said, "What about this?" and and ideas and, and philosophy and psychology of the business, and on and on and on. Um, and I'm happy for Steve. Yeah. Um, now, Rick, go, go, go ahead, Andy. Um, well, slight change of subject. Um, Ricky, if your son wanted to be a pro wrestler, would you encourage him? Would you let him? Would you say, no, I don't want you going into the business the way it is now? Um, let me put it to you this way. I don't know if there would be very much encouragement. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of things that the fans, as they view on television, that they don't see what goes behind closed doors. The, the business is very, very political. Even when I was in it, and maybe more so now, I, I'm not sure. I'm just sort of speculating. Um, would I? Um, I wouldn't discourage him. No, I, I probably sit him down and just tell him, okay, this is the real life. What I'm going to tell you. Um, and then if he if he chose to do it, I'd I'd, I'd be there at his side and and help him as much as he could. Uh, Has he ever I don't, I don't think I don't I don't think in any way that I would want to be in the position just just because I'm his father just put my foot down and just say downright no. But uh, I, I would think at that time if he made that decision that he would be he'd be a grown man and um, and then whatever whatever decision he makes for his future you know I would try to be there to support him. Has he ever Has expressed he... interest in that yeah. before? I'm sorry. Has he ever expressed interest in doing uh, that before? Uh, uh, not really. I mean, no. um, believe it or not, my son doesn't even watch it. He, he doesn't. Uh-huh. He's uh, what he watches right now. We're involved with racing. He watches NASCAR racing and all sorts of racing, and then he, that's what he watches. I mean, he, he looks at looks at these drivers, 
as as pretty much as well wrestling fans are looking at wrestlers as idolizing them and and as a fan and boy he could he could tell you the number of a car and and the driver you know from from Kyle Petty to Bobby Labonte and 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 Dale Earnhardt and all those guys you know he could tell you their car number and the driver so you know but it, it uh it's a direction that he likes doing right now he gives it a lot of effort and um I like the way he, he focuses on it and he goes for it. So, you know, the family is there to support him. Given what Jeff Hardy does to himself, I think uh, your son might be safer in a race car than in a wrestling ring these days. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Also, Rick, how come your two your, your two big title reigns, IC in '87 and Worlds in uh, WCW in '89, were so short? They, uh, you know, you were super poli- over at the time, and they were poli- poli- uh, Politics. Politics. Yeah. David, you you know that. Yeah, it was just it, it was out, it was out of his hands. It was just like this right. was this was the idea that the people making the decisions had at the time. Yeah, but I mean to, that big win over Savage in '87, then to lose it to Honky Tonk Man two months later. I mean that was just justice personified right there. Well, you, you know, I've had a couple of interviews like this, and I you know, and I've I've told the story, and uh, it, it, it just it just was an ego with with Vince. And then the politics behind it, and it's just just the way it goes, you know. You know, when I, when I was when I was told I was going to get the belt from Savage at WrestleMania three, I was told I was going to have it for about a year. Well, um, it just so happened that the year that I won the belt was also the same year that my son was born, and prior to winning the belt at WrestleMania, I just out of respect said. My son is going to come along around the beginning of July in 1987. Um, I'd like to have a couple weeks off during that time, just so I could be there for his for his birth. And the office, including Vince at that time, said, "Well, I don't see any problem. We, you know, you're just two weeks, okay?" Um, I won the belt, and then um, it was oh, maybe about three weeks later, four weeks later, at a TV. Vince came up to me and said that, okay, I'm going to be dropping about the honky-tonk. And then I said, well, we had discussion about it. I said, I told you before I won it, Savage, that uh would like to have that time off. But then Vince's comment says, well, it's it's uh, it's too long to have the Intercontinental belt dormant for a couple of weeks. And I said, two weeks, ta- three weeks? I Remember said, what are you talking about? I said, sometimes we don't go back to Chicago for a month later or something, or we go to Philly or, you know, like that, the way they do bookings. You know, we're traveling all around. I said, I don't understand this. And he said, well, no, he's, I want you to drop it to Honky Tonk. And I said, well, okay, no problem. I'll drop it to Honky Tonk. And then after I dropped it to Honky Tonk, I said, uh, well, I, after, during the, after that and on TV, I said, well, you know, I remember yeah, asking for that time off. Uh, to be with my wife, and so when my son came along, I said, instead of two weeks, I'm going to take six months off. So I took the rest of the year off. And that, and Vince didn't like that either. I mean, you know, it's just, you know, it's a, kind of a way of a wrestler having the last word of it, you know. And he, he looked at me, and, I, and I'm sure he thought that if he said, Ricky, I can't let you do that, at, at that time I probably would have given my notice. Um, in a very diplomatic way. I'm not the kind of guy that goes and screams and hollers or gets pissed off or something like that. I try to do a lot of reasoning and logic. And so I just, you know, very calmly said, you know, remember when I asked for two weeks off? I think I'd like to have six months off. And he looked at me and knew that I was serious. And he said, well, okay. Well, uh, when I came back, uh, the example was made at the next WrestleMania, which was at uh, uh, was it Jersey. Yeah, Trump Atlantic, Plaza, Atlantic right. City, yeah. and that was when they had the belt up and they're having a tournament, right, David? Yeah, right, right. That, right, right yeah, right, that right, was yeah. the night that Savage won the belt, uh, and I was eliminated by Valentine in the first right, round. Right, first round, right. right. You know, and I was looking at the card. I was looking at the brackets. They sort of had, like, brackets made up. And I said, okay, I get Valentine in the first round, and I said, okay, I'm just thinking to myself, I'll go over him. And then Savage, I knew Savage was going to win the belt. So Savage, I got him in the second round. I'll repay him the favor in a way that the way we would, pros used to, old pros used to think about. Savage let me win the Intercontinental belt in WrestleMania three. Okay, so I'm going to repay him the favor in the round two and so that he can keep moving on, keep advancing, and win the belt. No problem. It really, really shocked me when, 
um, I was told by um, uh, Strongbow that uh, I was going to lose in the first round of Valentine. I said, wow. Yeah. You know, but that was just the way of Vince just, just getting back a little bit, you know. Yeah, especially coming off of the fact that you had made such, you know, at that point in time, the match you, you had in Pontiac, and a lot of the matches you had, but that one had become, you know, a pretty famous deal. So a rematch of that at WrestleMania, you know, I mean, people would have, uh, you know, they would have popped pretty big for that one, especially oh, on that show, because that wasn't the best show in the history of wrestling, that 88 WrestleMania. No, no, I, I, <laughs> I agree with you. No, it wasn't, and I'm, and I'm sure that, you know, the fans would have just been really interested to see what the outcome of that match between Savage and I, you know, for Atlantic City. But, uh, you know, instead of thinking of uh, what is best for the company and best for the business, you know, a little bit of ego gets involved, and I got eliminated in the first round, so, yeah. Okay, we've got to go to David in New York. David, what's okay. happening? Okay, hey, uh, first question uh, for Ricky. Um, did you ever want have the urge to be a heel? Because you were, were you? A, did you ever have a run as a heel? Um, to answer the first part of your question is yes, and that was later towards the later part of my career. I thought, you know, I knew that I was for some reason, you know, after wrestling for so many years that I. I and it was coming to a close, and, and I was, and I was, I'm speaking from my heart. The last couple of years was a little bit of a struggle for me, and I'd always thought that before I get out of this damn business, I'm going to be able to work as a heel, and for once, walk over to the ropes and tell those people in the front row to shut up and sit down. You know, just do it once. Um, uh, of course, the opportunity never came about. I, I talked to. Uh, 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 people in the business, and they thought I was I was crazy. They said, "Man, you've been a babyface for all those years, and, and Ricky Steamboat be a heel, you'd be." It just won't. They won't believe it. That's the answer I got. They said they just will not believe it. So, you know, and that was at the time when the business was. Let's make it believable. Is Dave still on the phone? Or we're going to go to Corey right now. I'm still here. Okay, go ahead, Dave. Okay. Uh, next question is for Ricky is. Uh, I think it was last year at the Brian Pillman Memorial Show that you and Ric Flair hinted at doing a match at this year's show. I mean, have you talked about doing that at all? Did you say something about that? Uh, I'm having a hard time hearing you, but you said something about the Pillman Show with Flair and I are having a match. Remember, remember you two were in the ring and you kind of did that little thing, that little tease? Right. Yeah, and oh. I was just wondering if, if anyone's talked to you about, like, actually maybe actually doing a match with Flair on that show next year. No, this well, actually year. this year. Um, uh, that night, you know, we, we were getting a uh, response, and a couple of guys were asking, you guys really, are you guys working something here? You know, because none of the boys knew that it was going to happen. You know why? Because it was sporadic. It, 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 we just took the moment, and we just took the moment and ran with it. That's all we did. And it, it's very typical of Flair and myself, like, taking the moment in the match and running with it. And when we came back to the locker room, all the guys thought that it was something that was set up behind closed doors. And they were kind of curious about it. You guys going to be doing something? Hey, God, what a response we got from the crowd, you know, on and on and on. But the, the answer is no. We just we just had a little fun with it. Okay, we've got to go to, uh, we've got to, go to Corey in Iowa. Corey, what's going on? Hey, nothing much. How's it going, guys? Hey. Re Hey, uh, I just had a quick question uh, for Ricky. Um, I wanted to know what your thoughts are on the Internet today and on the uh, so-called uh, Smart Mark fans. I know that when you got into the business a long time ago, kayfabe was everything. Uh, what do you think about it today? Um, you know, once again, I understand that we've got to move on. We're on a, we, you know, this, the business has changed. Um Pretty much promotion has gone public on, uh, especially you know WWF and Vince and everything else. The way uh, the business, our business is run, but, you know, kind of being brought up from the old school, but also understanding that uh, this generation of, of fans that we have, you know, or uh, that have been uh, introduced to what the business is really all about. Okay, my feeling on it is um, when people ask me out on the road about this, this, and this in the business, or whatever it may be, or whatever the question may be, um, I can't give them an answer like, oh, man, it was real and everything else and all that kind of stuff because 
they give me a look back like they know that I'm lying. They actually know. So um, I can't help the way that the exposures went. I have no control over that. So actually just trying to, instead of trying to cover up and play hard-nosed with it, um, you know, any questions they ask me about the business, you know, I just, yeah, you know, it was done this way and it was done that way and what you heard was true and, and this and this and this and that. Um, and the business is really has turned more into that entertainment uh, layout anyway. So with me trying to stay hardcore and say, no, 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 it's all BS, uh, and thinking back the way the direction of the business is going. So uh, and I'm a pretty understanding guy to where, you know, years ago I would stick to my guns, but you, you got to understand that most of the people that have come up to me and talk about wrestling uh, and what they're seeing today, it's just the way the business has turned in another direction. And, and you can't deny it. That's the bottom line. You cannot deny it. So, you know, at times it you know it rubs me wrong a little bit. But maybe that's that's the old school steamboat. But then taking consideration, you got to understand the way things are going in today's world. You know, so hey, we got to move on. And we you know we got to just make adjustments. So, bottom line, I guess I'm pretty cool with it at times. Yeah. Do you think you're different from a lot of other old school guys that might be cool with it? Well, I'm, I I would have to say yes because I I do know some old school guys that would tell a fan is that when we did wrestling back in yesteryear, you know it was on the up and up. They're just taking it to a new level of business with entertainment because money talks, ratings talks, and on and on and on. But you know, and I, you know I've been with autograph sessions and stuff like that, and I just sort of look at the guy. And when the fan leaves, you know, he looks over at me, and I look over at him, and I say, "Well, you know, that's the way you want to do it, okay?" But I, th- I think these people today are much smarter. There's too much. There's too much. Um, there's too many answers out there that you have easy access to getting to. To to I know if you tell the today's fan that. You know, business is on the up and up. They walk away telling, you know, talking to themselves that that guy's that guy's full of bullshit. You know, so it's, yeah. it's you know, it's, it's 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 you know, it went from being you know not all that many years ago, but say even ten years ago, almost or and certainly fifteen, a secret society to like an open book is right. what it is now. You know, right. pretty much. Everyone knows. Everyone knows everything. It seems like you know, not everything, but a lot. Well, David, you know, um, as much as you're involved with it. And the, the the comments that I get, I said, well, okay, you know, we we understand that this is set up and the outcome of the match, everybody knows. But they they finished their line with that, boy, you guys sure do take a lot of abuse. I think and people that, understand that now more than ever before. Right? Yeah. You don't you hear that a lot, David? I think that well, the thing is now is that like so often when guys aren't on TV, you know, invariably ninety percent of the time that they're not is because of an injury, and people see. You know, like Steve Austin, who's like the most publicized guy, and he, you know, you know, his knee went out, his right. neck is hurt, and I think people when and if you just watch it with open eyes, knowing that guys can get hurt, and then you see what they do and watch it close, you, you, it's almost amazing to you that they're not hurt worse more often, and there's, you know, I think that that, you know, that type of thing is, you know, it's, it's not, it, it is, you know, a lot of the critics of wrestling before. You know, from 15 years ago, would like laugh and just go. These guys know how to land. No one ever gets hurt. And I don't think people say that one anymore. There's no respect for it now. Right, right. And I also think you know, um, uh, a little bit of what people are seeing with ECW, right, David? Yeah. All right, they're seeing that, and there's a lot of physical abuse in that. And then they hear or read about it in their local area that uh, the, the the backyard wrestling, right, David? Sure. A guy's coming off the roof of his house, right? But that's to me. That's a little silly. I know. I know that's a little silly. But the, you know, the, the but the general public, you know, they're reading about it in the local newspaper. So and so is right. wrestling in his backyard. He jumps off the roof of his house and does a big splash on the guy and drops a knee on him and breaks the guy's ribs and people getting hurt and all that, all and all and all. So in the back of their mind, they say, okay, well, you know, these guys are. You know, they're doing the ring, and and then I hear about so and so is just getting hurt, and he's getting knee surgery. One guy's got to you know, hurt his neck; he's out for for good. You know, 
So maybe, the, you know, in the back of their mind, they, they sit back and they start thinking about this, and they put two to two together and say, you know, this business is really physical. You know, even though that we might know who, they might know who the outcome is, but God, these guys are really taking a lot of abuse out there. Yeah, to put on to put on a, a really entertaining performance. We've got a phone call from Athens, Greece. It's uh, Dustin. Dustin, how you doing? All uh, right. Um, my question's for Dave. Um, have you heard anything about them doing another legend show like they did a couple of months back on pay per view? Like Heroes of Wrestling? Yeah. Uh, probably not. The first one was uh, not. It was not successful at all. No. Uh, in, on every on every did level. Did we get a buy rate for that show? Yeah. It was like uh, I think it was less than a point one. No, yeah, was it? Yeah. Um, David, what about what they had last night? With a steel and Snooker and everything? Yeah. Yeah, they just brought in uh, George Steele, Tito Santana, and Jimmy Snooker to wrestle Jeff Jarrett, and uh, they thought that it would help with the ratings. It really it really didn't help with the ratings at all. Um, Snooker got a nice pop. Snooker came off the top of a cage with a splash like I, he did with Don Morocco, you know, 17, 18 years ago. Right, right. Yeah. I, I mean, didn't you see the show, but I, I, I got a lot of... Uh, a lot of my gym members today talking about it. Yeah, it was pretty. Um, it was actually Monday night, but it was. Uh, it's pretty amazing at, at, at Snooker's age to be to be doing something like that. With, with um, the, when he went up there, it was just like, oh my god. I mean, I remember when he was, you know, like I said, like I said, 82. He did that a couple of times, but it's right. like it's not 82 anymore, and he hasn't even been wrestling full time on a major level. And uh, he went off the top of the cage, and then Benoit went off the top of the cage right. on uh, Jarrett. Uh, how old is Snooker now? Uh, would guess 56. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's within a, I'm within a year one way or the other on that one. Yeah, I just remembered the Heroes of Wrestling. All I did was a cross body off the top, so I thought, you know, this poor guy's knees must be shot. And then he goes into the cage and does a splash, and I thought, wow. Yeah, because he didn't even do the splash on the on that pay-per-view. That's right, he did the, he did a cross body. Yeah. Bob uh, Orton. David, how old is Snooker? I think 56-ish. Yeah. Does that, that that sounds about? Um, I think he might yeah. even be older than that. You might, you I was might talking be right. to someone yesterday who they said he was 56 like four years ago. They were hanging out with him. Uh, could be. I just remember um, when there was a time in uh, in '83. Actually, you know, so it's funny they were talking about that that arrest in '83. Yeah. Um, he was 39 then, so that was uh, that's 16 years. Uh, make him 55, maybe. You know, you know, I, you know, I don't know, something like that. Something uh, do, you remember, do you remember today at my club asked me how old was Snook, and I said mid 50s. Yeah. Yeah. Now, didn't you um, do a bodybuilding contest with him, or maybe even more than one? At, at one point. We did one. I mean, yeah. We we competed against each other one time. Yeah. That was that was <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, um, have you heard anything about Smash's condition either? You know, from the demolition. Yeah, I talked to Axe like, uh, back in September, and he said Smash broke his butt in Japan. Barry Darso? Now, yeah. Barry, Darso's, um, Barry Darso's wrestling for WXO, I think. <laughs> Axe yeah. told me he said he was over in Japan, and they got powerbombed outside the ring and got hurt real bad, and he's in the hospital in New York. No, 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 no. He's crazy. He, he, no, he's wrestling, in, uh, he's wrestling for, um, for the WXO group. Uh, yeah. he, was, he was working with Barry Darso in WCW until they, they let him go. Oh. Um, have you heard anything about Flair coming back? As a, he hadn't been on Nitro in a while. Uh, Flair, they've been. They talked on Friday about bringing Flair back, and the two sides still didn't come to an agreement. Uh, Flair wants to come back as a heel. They want him as a baby face. Uh, he didn't want to come in and get squashed by Nash, which was, even though that's not what they say they want, when you look at the booking, that is what they want. So it's kind of, I don't think he wants to come back and be putting Nash over every time now. Um, there's a lot of... I think Flair is, is, is and, and rightfully so, is unhappy about the fact that he probably means more in, in, in ratings than just about anyone in the company. And, you know, he's had a longer career and all that with the company than, than anyone. And he's making, and he, and, he work, and he willingly works house shows, which most of the top guys don't do. And at the same time, he's making like half of what these other guys are making that, you know, are, are not even as big ratings draws or, or house show draws as he is. So there's a frustration there right now. Or, right? or even or even showing up as many house shows as he is. Well, he's willing to go. I mean, these other guys, you know, you know, don't want to go. And then that, when they do go, they start they start coming up with injuries like two days before they're supposed well, to go well, on the road. Well, that's what I'm saying. Here's Flair. Uh, God, maybe 15 years older, okay, than these guys. Um. Making half the money, um, working twice as many shows, 
That's what I meant. You know, showing up at the at the house shows when these guys are doing no shows. Right. Right. And and so. getting getting paid half the money and on and on and on. You know, it just uh, you know just just the way the that part of the business sort of befuddles me in the way it's turned. You know, these guys are still being able to get. You know, David, years ago. If it was a situation to where I wasn't going to show up at these house shows because either I got a stomach ache or something or or my knee hurts, you know, uh, my pay you, you would get paid. Yeah. You know that's that's the bottom line. And if it kept up, you'd be you'd be having a loser lose you would have a, a loser to leave town match with a U-Haul stuck on the back of your tra- the car. Yeah, and they would actually enforce the stipulation. Now they do loser leave towns and then they wrestle the next day. Right. On TV. <laughs> and, you know, and even if you get yeah. like a a five hundred dollar bonus now, if you're making a million five, you can go without that five hundred bucks. Yeah, that's the other thing is that yeah yeah the, the the contracts are so big and these guys now think that they're you know and 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 in a sense they are that they're television stars and that it's beneath them to actually do house shows. That's one of the things that's really hurt the WCW house show business because that mentality is not there in the WWF. Well, you know, everyone everyone who's physically able is on the road. Well, that's what I heard is, uh, you know, the difference they, between the, they advertise who's going to be at the house show and actually the guys that do show up and the number of substitution that, that keeps going on and on and on has hurt the company. Well, even when you were, even when you were there, they had that problem and it, it's never changed. Yeah. Well, one thing I, I have to say about Vince is that he he doesn't tolerate or put up with that, you know. Yeah, Rick. Before but we're we're just about out of time, but I wanted to ask you one real quick thing for some of the listeners who don't know. Could you pretty much describe like um, the injury? Um, you know, your last match actually was with Steve Austin a couple of years back, and right. and you suffered a back injury, and right. and that pretty much finished your wrestling career. And right. and how are you physically as far as like the back right now? I mean, is it is it better than it was then, or is it does it still give you trouble? No, it. it it gives me trouble every day. I do. I went through 10 to 12 weeks of uh, therapy at the Charlotte Spine Center. Um, I, I have to do a number of different stretches. Uh, I do continue to work out, but it's very, very light as compared to when, uh, you know, the way I used to work out years ago with squatting and benching and deadlifting and all that kind of stuff. Um, I've got two real bad discs. I've got one disc and a piece of disc matter has broken off. Uh, leaving that, it's, um, it's almost like an inner tube in a tire and it's bubbled out, okay? Mm-hmm. So that area is really weak. I had a, uh, a, what I did, I suffered a spinal compression in which my vertebrae is compressed and, uh, I do have periodic, uh, pain down both legs. I even have what, a thing that's called floppy foot to where my one leg will go completely dead all the way down to my foot. So, uh, it just flops. And, and, uh, so, you know, I just gotta be careful. Uh, my heart would like to have those matches with the Flair or the Savage or, or the Austins, but, uh, you know, my head is telling me, uh, physically, uh, you know, I could have a real bad bump in the ring and it could really create a problem and which would affect me for the rest of my life and what I'm able to do with my son, even as something, something as simple as going out there and throwing the football or baseball with him. Things will change. Uh, I've had, I've been to four different specialists, been to Duke University. I've had a CAT scan and MRIs done to my back. Uh, I kept going for different doctors and getting different opinions and hoping I'd get the one guy that would tell me, he says, well, you know, I think you'll be all right to go back. But uh, on four different occasions, four different specialists, and not one of them um, calling up the other doctor and saying, well, what do you think? They never converse with each other. Uh, I got the same answer. They they all kept telling me, you have one bad bump on your back. We're going to put these two screws in your back that are about three inches long, and your life is going to change for the rest of your life. You know, so, you know, after four different, do- you know, I just, man, what the, what the hell's going on here, you know? Did you ever uh, settle the, the law? I, was there, do you have a lawsuit outstanding with WCW at one point, not, not all that long ago? Is that still going, or is that pretty much done? Say again, say again. Did you had a lawsuit with WCW? I think a couple of years ago. Right. Is that still going, or has that been settled? Uh, we never settled, um, and it's not going on. Okay. Uh, they just played hard nose with me. Uh, I think I had about two months left of my contract, maybe three, about twelve weeks. Uh, I felt that uh, after uh, working with the company, and as hard as we did, 
uh, you know, they just cut me off for the last 12 weeks of my pay. And I said, uh, and we weren't talking a whole lot of money, not, not by today's standards. And I just thought it was a rook, you know. It's, uh, I got hurt working for you guys. I said, you know, just, you know, finish paying out my uh, my contract for about the next 12 weeks. You know, there's guys now that don't even work and they're still getting their big money. I don't know. Oh, God, you should see. You wouldn't even believe it now. David, let me, before we close, how much time we got? We're actually, like, totally done. We've got to, like, get out. So, so anything real last you want to say right at the end? Um, maybe, all right, just some food for thought. And you and I could do this again. Okay, right. I'd love to. All right. All right. Can you imagine? I mean, everybody asked me, what, you know, Ric Flair back in his day, you know, and all that kind of stuff, Randy Savage, myself, Jake the Snake Roberts and all that guy. How about if we took the cast of characters, all those guys in their early years, you know, the way they, they brought the business, what kind of reaction would they get in today's wrestling with the way they're promoting it? But look at a rookie Flair. Look at a rookie Savage. Look at a, a rookie Don Morocco or look at a Jake the Snake and, you know, all those guys. You know what I'm saying? Do you know you mean? In, do you mean in their prime or? Um, yeah, you know after or, they, you know after they. Oh, well, they, every everyone if they, you know, it's all the political game. If you were allowed to shine, you know, you would. I don't think there's any question. You know, I'm it's, looking, it's, it's, it's a question of being allowed. You know, I'm looking at a flare of like 1976. Yeah, yeah, Rick, we are we are like totally out of time right now. Okay. I've got to get running. Okay, right. and don't forget, everybody, we'll be back here at six o'clock tomorrow. I want to thank Ricky Steamboat. I want to thank Brian, and don't forget, Brian's on Yahoo.